In your book, you mentioned that, uh, quote, as a management professor and a longstanding Buddhist practitioner, I felt a moral duty to start speaking out when large corporations with questionable ethics and dismal track records and corporate social responsibility began introducing mindfulness programs as a method of performance enhancement. And so I guess pulling off of that, uh, there's this element that you talk about in the book that basically mindfulness at work creates a situation where people are just better adjusted cogs. And so just trying to extrapolate that and pull some threads off of it. I'm wondering if we can actually talk about maybe the type of impact a mindfulness program in the workplace could be having or should be having. So like from your perspective, you know, if you were talking to a founder of a company, they're 18 years old, they're just starting a startup, or if you were talking to the CEO of one of the largest firms, whether they're 18 years old or 60 years old, I'd be curious as to what you might want to share with them if they are considering implementing a mindfulness program and if you think there might be alternatives to enhance worker performance in place of that mindfulness program. Yeah, I could do that. Um, but could I uh, go back a few few steps first? Um, Please. Because I think we have to unpack this a little bit more. Um, yeah when it comes to corporate mindfulness. And I think we could start with how I called into question really um, what I felt was the diagnosis, uh, that the diagnosis uh, just seemed a little too convenient for me. In other words, that the stress that people were experiencing uh, supposedly had nothing to do with their ac either their actual material conditions or the, the unreasonable dem demands that were being placed upon them in the workplace. Instead, stress was kind of framed and uh, as this private subjective uh, condition. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, the individual needed to take personal responsibility for the stress they were experiencing. And that's because it did come out of a medical setting and because behavioral uh, medicine is based on individual interventions and it has a medical understanding of stress. It has a de depoliticized understanding of stress as, as a biological uh, a source of stress is biological. So I felt that that was a little too convenient Uh and when you kind of place the burden in the locus of control uh, of psychological stress entirely upon the individual, that what that does is it erases any questions of a larger diagnosis of what are the sources of stress besides just individual reactivity. If someone has, uh, you know, the way we respond to situations is our responsibility. Right. We can't, we can't uh, rule that out. But <laughs> there's a lot of other factors going on that cause workplace stress besides, you know, the fact that, you know, maybe I, I have an anger problem. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe there's a reason I have an anger problem in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I mean, now look at what's happened with the great resignation. Yeah. People have kind of wised up to the fact that, you know, I kind of like the quality of, uh, quality of life I have now by not having to... Uh, drive, you know, uh, 60 miles in, in rush hour traffic and, and, uh, work nine to five. I'm more productive at home, you know? So, um, anyway, to make a long story short, um, the social and environmental factors that contribute to stress are sort of not part of the equation in, in the mindfulness industry, especially in the corporate mindfulness industry. So I, I really needed to challenge that dominant narrative uh, that privatizes the causes of stress. And this is then how it becomes co-opted in a way uh, and how it can function as a form of social control uh, because by placing the burden squarely on the individual employee, you know, it basically lets the corporation off the hook for any responsibility for the stressors that they are generating within their own corporate culture, for example. So that's one point I, I really needed to make first. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this 
the idea of privatization and how we privatize, you know, even mental health issues have become highly privatized. And it's kind of a part of a whole historical trend of how capitalism has always kind of co-opted spiritualities and turned them into these highly individualistic forms, which are then accommodated to uh, the dominant economic and uh, values uh, uh, and, and corporate interests, so corp corporatized type spiritualities. So, um, you know, a, a great example of this, um, one of the more more recent examples, of course, you may have seen this in the in the media, is uh, Amazon's uh, working wellness program, which uh, now is called Amazon. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they uh, yeah. There's there was quite a few articles out there about three or four months ago about this, and um, uh, as we all know, Amazon has been putting. I don't know if you saw that. What was uh, uh, the British comedian's show who did a whole special? John Oliver. John Oliver's uh, special on Amazon's uh, anti-union campaigns. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues at San Francisco State, he was. Uh, some of his articles were quoted on that show. John Logan. Oh, very nice. cool. Um, but on the shop floor of these warehouses at Amazon, they have these little kiosks, these booths that are vertical booths. They kind of look like upright coffins. You know, and so uh, <laughs> employees can go into these booths and, and it, they have these interactive uh, uh, videos uh, and you can kind of like take a three minute break and watch a mindfulness video and uh, then go back to work. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. So to me, it was like that was like the, po the Amazon, Amazon or whatever it's called is now like the, the new poster child for me for corporate mindfulness programs mm, mm -hmm. that exactly do what I'm talking about, how they place the burden on an individual and not address any of the, the systemic and structural factors that are causing stress in the, uh, in the environment. 